pain and vanity. Yeah. I found pain and vanity to be two huge motivators in my practice for people. Pain and vanity will and definitely. It, yep. So let's yep. just go down the line though, really quick. As you were talking, I was thinking of so many things, like let's talk about the issues that people do deal with when they get older. Yeah. Right. And as we age, let's talk about brain dysfunction, dementia, and Alzheimer's metabolic dysfunction, yep. thyroid issues, metabolic dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, metabolic dysfunction, breast cancer. You know, you were talking about these women walking into your practice and like, boom, one day everything was not okay. A lot of those women, unfortunately are walking in saying, boom, I got breast cancer. How did I get this? Dr. Tina Moore, welcome to the root cause medicine podcast, girl. I am so excited to have you on this. Oh, I'm so happy to be here with you. Finally, we've been trying and we had you on my podcast a few weeks ago. So I'm stoked to be here. Always fun to talk to you. It is always. And for everyone who is listening right now, they should know that we got on to do this podcast 35 minutes ago and have been talking, 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 talking catching up ever since. And we even live basically in the same state and don't see each other that often. So we get, that's, we just do podcasts to hang out. <laughs> we, well, we can't, we can't pull you away from your Sunday football though. So we, that's no, why. <laughs> right. Priorities. Tis the season. I, we are a football family. I grew up in a football family. So tis the season. Well, today we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about immune system. We're going to talk about resiliency. We're going to talk about, you know, uh, how to make yourself stronger and harder to kill because that's really from a lot of years because your expertise personally in um, surviving autoimmune, uh, surviving viruses, um, thriving. And you know now with the situation of the world that we're in, you've just been one of those voices that I write from the beginning. I'm like, yep, this girl, this girl, like let's be harder to kill. Let's be resilient. Let's thrive through all of this. Um, let's be proactive. I'm a very proactive type A person and uh, you are as well. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today for everyone listening who's like, enough, I need to be proactive and I would like to be resilient. We don't feel resilient. I love it. Well, <laughs> where shall I start? I was a really sick little kid and pump full of antibiotics, like straight out the chute. I joke that I don't have a microbiome. <laughs> it's been obliterated. Unfortunately, that has set me up for a life of antibiotic use because small infections tend to become large problems for me. And I had my tonsils and adenoids out when I was a kid, which definitely set you up for a life of pneumonia, which I, for a time, definitely struggled with chronic pneumonia uh, bouts. And I finally, I think it was somewhere around 40, you know, we're both naturopathic doctors. You were a resident when I was in school. I was a big fan. I used to follow you around the hallways and I was like, someday, someday I'll be as cool <laughs> as Carrie Jones. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you didn't fit the bill there, you know, neither of us did. So right. I, I always sought out my, my peers. Um, anyway, I got into naturopathic school and I was doing chiropractic college concurrently and over at the chiropractic college, I'm a chiropractor as well. And all the chiropractors were like, we have to strengthen these muscles to get them to relax. We have to strengthen these muscles to get things to balance out. We have to strength, you know, strength, strength, strengthen the muscles. And I'm over at naturopathic school and it's just like, here, take this supplement, eat that food, take the supplement, eat that food. And what I saw over at the naturopathic college, no disrespect to the crew over there, but I saw a bunch of skinny, skinny ligamentous laxity women for the most mm -hmm. part with pot bellies and skinny little arms and legs that did yoga. Mm -hmm. Their diets were impeccable. They took you know, piles of pills, just supplement form, but they didn't look generally speaking like a very healthy bunch. Um, so I was like, yeah. and then somewhere around 40, I started realizing that I had tried all the passive care. I had flown everywhere. I had everything. I, I was at that point, several years into chronic uh, viral issues. So post-viral syndrome, it would wax and wane. Uh, I got hit with cytomegalovirus when I was 19. It almost killed me and it took me out of college. And that's a whole other story, but this had been a lifelong situation for me. And I realized around 40, I was like, this whole passive care model is nonsense. Like mm -hmm. I'm over it. I'm tired of IVs. I'm tired. I was, I had access to the coolest stuff. I still have access to as a regenerative medicine doctor. That's what I did for a decade in practice. Like I have access to the coolest stuff and none of it works unless your foundation is solid. And so I, at that point was riddled with chronic spinal pain, particularly low back pain. I was skinny and I felt I was in my thirties and I felt like if I were to fall over, I was going to shatter. Like I just, I can't describe it. I just, and people, when I say that, who feel that way, get it. I just felt like I was going to shatter into a million pieces. And so I went on a quest to get stronger and I started looking at women who had physiques that I liked 
honestly. I yeah. mean, it was like, who of these older women as women are aging? Because a lot of women will stay skinny forever, but those women break their hips. And I was seeing them in practice in chronic pain, these little skinny, low protein, you know, they don't eat a lot of anything. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they still fit in their tiny little jeans. They've always fit in, but you've seen them, these mm -hmm. pretty little, beautiful, thin women. They're usually white. And, and I say that because osteoporosis is skinny white girl syndrome in, <laughs> in chiropractor terms. And so I thought, you know, these women are in chronic pain They're They have no glutes, their knees are all wobbly. They have hip issues. Like, I don't want any of this. And so I started studying muscle as, yeah. as like the actual muscle as an organ system, not just for looks, but as an organ system, as at the same time, I started lifting weights and I totally geeked out on it. Here we are many years later. And it sounds like the world at large is starting to pick up on it. But I mean, that was what in 2014, 2015, when I really started doubling down on it. So I'm excited people are waking up to it. And I think that it's so particularly important right now, as we are facing, well, you know, a really amplified fear of viruses, which uh, seems to be the, the thing right now. And there's just no getting around the fact that frailty will always set you up for increased risk of death. Low muscle mass will always set you up for increased risk of death for anything, for any reason whatsoever, whether it's a chronic debilitating uh, condition like autoimmune disease or cancer even, or if it's something acute like a bacterial or a viral infection. So that's really my message when I say be harder to kill because that ties into metabolism, which is also my passion. And you know, 90, what 94% last time I looked 94% of us adults are metabolically unsound. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, I am sure your listeners here get it, but in the allopathic model, they just chase down conditions like cardiovascular disease and cancer and all the things that are killing far more Americans than COVID ever will. And they want to blame that condition and treat that condition. But the underlying root cause is metabolic dysfunction. And the underlying root cause, in my opinion, to all the metabolic dysfunction is lack of muscle mass. Hmm. So, so that's, de that's define kind of it. metabolic instability or inflexibility, or, you know, what does that mean? If somebody says that's me and it can really be either end of the spectrum, you, you can actually, um, not be really sort of thin, right? Like we have, we have people who are just don't have a lot of muscle. Maybe they have a lot of adipose tissue. There are their other end of the spectrum, but they're also just as frail. They're also in chronic pain. They're also the ones who are, you know, quick to break something or fracture something, or they're not that strong. Um, lifting heavy things is, is tough for them. They, they, they can't walk very well. They kind of shuffle when they walk. So you can be at either end of the spectrum. So explain what this, the metabolic is when you see a patient come in or when you saw a patient come in. Yeah. So to quickly address what you said, you know, interestingly folks who are metabolically unsound and are thin or tofi, as we call it, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And I'm using fat, not in a derogatory term, but just simply that's how we describe it. It's tofi. Mm -hmm. Those folks are actually at much higher risk for death from all causes than folks who are actually have an abundance of adipose tissue or fat tissue on their bodies. So being underweight and metabolically unsound is a disaster waiting to happen. Being overweight actually sets you up for being metabolically dysfunctional. Uh, our bodies are meant to hoard fat. Mm -hmm. That's what we're supposed to do. If I think of us as primal animals, you know, we're nomadic. We're not really supposed to be like all the problems started when we put down stakes and started agricultural societies. Like mean, that's when we started seeing chronic debilitating issues like osteoporosis and osteoarthritis and, you know, heart disease and all those things. So imagine we're primal, we're, we're nomadic, we're moving around. We're not going to come across a lot of sugar and we're not going to come across a lot of food all the time. But in our modern society, it's all high fructose corn syrup all the time, 24 seven. It's all car refined carbohydrates all the time, 24 seven. And it's not that any one thing is the devil in this. It's that all of it combined constantly. I heard a chiropractor once say that America is a food trough. We mm. just eat all the time. And then you and I are both old enough to remember when they told us you got to eat six times a day if you want to feel better and lose weight. And I think that was really a bad bit of advice. And so people are eating all day long. They're spiking their insulin all day long. They're spiking their blood sugar and their insulin all day long. And metabolic health really is the ability to ingest nutrients and metabolize those nutrients appropriately. 
I mean, that's kind of it, like it, yeah. to make it as simple as possible. And when you hear the term cardiometabolic health, in my mind, that's your metabolic health that is impacting your cardiovascular system. The two are very intimately tied and there's metabolic immune health, which as our mutual friend, Mike Mutzel says, you know, immune system and metabolism are two sides of the same coin. So if we've got 94% of Americans metabolically unhealthy, the majority of them actually at this point are probably overweight to obese, mm -hmm. but there's still a huge group of very malnourished, deconditioned, very thin folks, frail folks yeah. on the other side. And so we're just kind of sitting in a hot mess and it's no wonder that I mean, if you go to our world in data, you look at any of these sites that show you graphs of COVID, America is getting their butt handed to them compared to other countries, compared to all other countries. Yeah. And there's a lot of theories why that could be true, but I think we can all agree that metabolic health is pretty poor in this country. And that's probably a huge driving factor in all of this. And I don't think this is going to stop or end until we address that. I also don't think it's sustainable. It's simply not like humans cannot live like this for a whole lot longer. We're, you know, we were seeing infertility skyrocket mm -hmm. prior to COVID. We were seeing all kinds of problems prior to COVID. Nobody was paying attention. This has just kind of put a spotlight on it for those paying attention uh, to maybe not just the mainstream media, but you mentioned that you saw a commercial where they mentioned yeah. diabetes, yep. you know, finally that's coming out in the, in the media. But like, we were seeing that in the data straight out of China when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And yeah. those of us who tried to raise the flag and say, Hey guys, get your metabolism in order. It can happen pretty quickly. Actually, things can shift for the better quite rapidly. Uh, we really got beat on and vilified and attacked and silenced. Right. And I still don't know why, but yeah. Yeah. I was saying to you that now that it's, now that it's football season and I'm actually watching TV again, I don't watch a lot of TV in general. Um, uh, but the commercials in between are, um, they're COVID commercials, COVID related commercials. And it's like, if you have type two diabetes, if you are obese, if you have cardiovascular disease um, or high cardiovascular risk, like, you know, you are at a higher risk for uh, the uh, sequelae of COVID and COVID outcomes. And we just weren't seeing that two years ago, three, you know, six months ago, three, three years ago. Uh, and now because there's, you can't deny it, you know, now the data is there and you can't deny it. So while I'm glad to see it, in the commercials, um, it's unfortunate that it's took what it took to get there. Right. And Absolutely. they, they, they masquerade it as like, Oh, obesity or this. And so folks say, well, I'm not obese Eh, you might still be, you know, metabolically very unsound. And here's the clincher that people don't understand when you're metabolically unsound, you're not only in, in probably my opinion, because usually when you're metabolically unsound, you have low muscle mass, the two go hand in hand in hand. I don't care what size your body ends up being. The two are very much one is causing the other. It's a chicken and egg, right? right? It goes round and round. And so I always say diabetes starts in the thighs and the glutes because once they start to waste, your metabolism starts to go anyway. Yeah. Poor metabolic health really, I believe is the smoking gun that sets you up for poor outcomes with this virus. However, here's the interesting part. It also sets you up for potentially carrying more Viron or mm -hmm. higher viral titers, meaning you are potentially more infectious to others. So there's a big problem that nobody's talking about or addressing. And I'm, again, I'm not pointing any fingers. These are just the facts. We had right. all this data with the influenza virus. And when I speculated, it might be true with this virus, I got a lot of slack for it, but now we have all the data to show I was indeed correct. Mm -hmm. And then here's the real clincher and not to get into the vaccine topic, but I think it's important that the audience understand this when you are the, the same folks that are at most high risk for poor outcomes with this virus are actually the same folks that are having a terrible time seroconverting well and having good lasting immunity with the vaccine or any vaccine for that matter. We knew this with all the prior vaccines. This is right. not new news. So like I said earlier, if your metabolism, metabolism is unsound, I feel like we're doing like a limerick. <laughs> your <laughs> your uh, immune system isn't going to be as solid as it could be or maybe very much messed up. And so you're not going to have the advantage of having a vaccine work as well for you. And I just think that's important to note, regardless of what side anyone is on this. And that's the message I've been trying to send. I think I got vilified for being an anti-vaxxer when I'm not. I I really, if people understood what was going on in my personal life, they'd realize I absolutely am not a, in that camp. I just am someone who asks questions and I'm like, hey, we still need to address this problem, folks. Right, right, right. You and know? even even down it just for um, 
like news, new news came out today around, you know, fertility and hormones and menstruation as related to viruses. And even I'm doing a lecture here soon on uh, thyroid, just basic hypo, it's a basic hypothyroid lecture that I'm doing. And um, boy, we have learned a lot in the last couple of years around the effect of inflammation, um, poor metabolic control, insulin issues, glucose issues, but what, are, so inflammation has messengers, like little, their, their version of text messages are called inflammatory cytokines. And so, and I was doing a lot of this research um, in, in thyroid, new publications are like, oh gosh, you know what? If somebody has a high level of these inflammatory cytokines, these in, like little fires that are all over the body somewhere, um, it really screws up your thyroid. So it doesn't mean your gland is a problem. You don't actually have thyroid gland disease your gland might be fine, but your thyroid's going to react accordingly. It gets, it gets very affected when you're inflamed, it's, which is a good thing. Your, your, your glands in your body, whether it's your adrenal glands, your ovaries, your testicles, your thyroid, like they should react when there's a four alarm fire happening yep. somewhere. Now an acute four alarm fire is one thing. I had a sinus infection, a true sinus infection, not COVID two weeks ago. And I could imagine if I tested all my hormones, then they'd be a hot mess because hormones aren't, aren't the priority when you're working with a sinus infection, a four alarm fire. But what people don't realize is that they have maybe low grade two alarm fires happening in their body all the time. They have inflammation in their arteries and that's why they have cardiovascular disease or you know high blood pressure, cholesterol issues. They have four, two alarm fires in their muscles, which is why they have low back pain all the time or osteoarthritis you know, in their knees or their ankles or you know, the joints. They've got it in their brain, they brain fog, they have memory issues. Um, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it can be actual pain or the, or the sort of two alarm fire can be more these crazy symptoms that you're like, oh, I always think like, I always have brain fog or, you know, my periods are always like that. Or, you know, my, my fatigue, it's not like that bad, but, you know, give, I just need enough coffee and then I can get going and not realizing that these are all sort of downstream effects of these little two alarm fires. And so it was, what was really great is to tie it back. And I will talk in this lecture is when we have this inflammation or even metabolic issues. If somebody, it, 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 it's related to everything. The system works as a whole, yes. right? They, the system works as a whole. I always say that it's, it's the spider web. If you pluck one end of a spider web, the whole thing vibrates. So if you have glucose and insulin issues, if you have cardiometabolic, if you've been diagnosed with heart disease things or blood sugar things, immune system things. It doesn't just stay in that category. Yes, you might be seeing a cardiologist or an endocrinologist, but really your whole system is affected. It, it's not siloed. And um, unfortunately it gets taught that it's siloed, that, it, right. that one doesn't impact the other. And I love that you just keep saying like, oh no, it affects the whole system. Well, it's all metab metabolic health. Yeah. Like all, everything you just mentioned, those two alarm fires are raging on because of poor metabolic health at yeah. the end of the day. And you can't fix any of these things with any of, I don't care if it's nutraceuticals or pharmaceuticals or shots or pills or magic potions. None of it's truly fixable mm -hmm. or mitigated well, unless the metabolism is in check. Right. So it's, you right. know, you just chase your tail and go in circles and you're like, I wonder why this keeps creeping up because metabolically things. And that doesn't mean that being metabolically sounds going to solve every problem in the world, but you certainly can't fix anything without it is my right. opinion. Right. So, no, and I, I would, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I want, I want you to talk, go back to the muscle part of it. Um, you know, we often, you, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon talk about being under muscled. So it's not necessarily about being overweight, but under muscled. And I think that confuses a lot of people because when they step on the scale, they're like, no, no, I'm, I'm dense, right? Like I'm a dense person. I, I know I have muscle, but really if they were to get proper, um, a, you know, a proper imaging so they could see the difference between their, their muscle, their skeletal muscle percent, as opposed to their adipose percent. And then of course we have different kinds of adipose. We have, we have the kind that's all over the organs. And then we have sort of the more superficial kind. That's when you can really see how much skeletal muscle you have on your body. But so can you explain like, what does it mean? What does having muscle, yes. muscle mass on the body mean? Just because you get on the scale and look dense doesn't mean you, it's all skeletal muscle. Well, I'll start by saying this because it fits in with what I said before about the TOFI. Folks who are walking around with obesity actually do tend to have a decent, decently more skeletal muscle mass than those who are very thin. And it's because they're having to 
carry a bigger load around. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see, you know, often strong calf muscles, you'll see it, right. You'll see it in different folks and different folks are built differently. I'm not saying everybody needs to be built the same out here where I live out in the country. I've noticed a lot of really strong women Mm -hmm. who are, um, they're, they are well muscled, but they also have a decent layer of adipose tissue, most predominantly around their midsection. And so that's the kind of mid, that's the kind of fat distribution we don't want to see. That's not that's not so healthy, right? That's how you really start those three and four alarm fires on the regular, right? Because that visceral fat is basically a little cytokine depot and your subcutaneous fat. I don't care what anyone says. uh, I've seen it on myself and I've seen it too many times in patients when they start to get stressed out of their mind or they're drinking too much or they're eating too many carbs. They get a little layer of fluff on their tummy too, I call it. And that's that subcutaneous fat. It it tends to come with the visceral fat. Uh, It's all inflammatory and it's a little you're walking around with a cytokine suit on your body. The cool thing about muscle is that one, it essentially eats fat. It creates this afterburn effect in your body and it really helps modulate how your insulin's working, therefore how your adipose is laid down and then how your adipose is burned. And that's very much contingent on insulin, which we can get into, but insulin and metabolic health all go hand in hand. Insulin resistance, poor metabolic health, kind of the same term, really Mm -hmm. same thing. Muscle secretes myokines, which are these anti-inflammatory molecules. So interleukin six coming out of a well-trained skeletal muscle is actually anti-inflammatory. So you can build this suit of anti-inflammatory goodness on your body to combat the cytokines. The cytokines are what are getting people into trouble with these chronic lifestyle diseases. I call them like type two diabetes, which is hundred percent lifestyle disease. And only in my opinion, fixable 100% through lifestyle. We can metformin it all day. I've seen that multiple times. It doesn't work. Eventually the metformin quits working so well. So that's a lifestyle disease as well. Um, and we see a lot of wasting as we age because that's just part of it's called inflammaging. And so as we age, we will become more metabolically unhealthy. We will become more insulin resistant. It's just a matter of time. It's not if it's when, and that's why you start to see older folks start to waste because Mm -hmm. that low grade inflammation wastes your skeletal muscle. So that's why I say it's chicken and egg. What came first? It's hard to say. I think most folks are, you know, were we to back up 20, 30 years, I would say most folks were probably developing type two diabetes most predominantly if they were very deconditioned. I think nowadays we're seeing the inflammation being driven by the adipose contributing to that wasting. And interestingly, when you have a lot of adipose on you, or I should say in the visceral area, when you've got that really kind of metabolically unhealthy apple shaped situation going on. Mm -hmm. Uh, It doesn't matter how much skeletal muscle you have that metabolic or insulin resistance, whatever it is that will continue to cause wasting, particularly in the extremities. So that's why you see skinny little arms and legs with these big pot bellies. They've got no, butt, they've got no arms and legs, and it's very difficult to reverse that and to get that moving, but it is the only way out. Yeah. So the only way to start the transformation towards metabolic health, to sop up all that excess insulin, to add more GLUT4 receptors, to add more mitochondria to your body, to get all the systems working better is to add muscle mass to the body. That's the beginning. The fastest way to get out of fatty liver is to lift weights and to start eating a lower carbohydrate diet or whatever diet. I hate to say that because I have friends that are like fruititarians and they swear by it for reversing diabetes. So I don't want to put, I prefer an animal-based diet. So whatever your healthcare practitioner is whatever's working for you. Sometimes you might have to try a couple things, but whatever gets that metabolic health moving in the right direction, I promise you it will happen a hundred times faster if you start adding muscle. And so I tell people, don't worry so much about the fat loss. Let's focus on the strength gain because Mm -hmm. when you are, when all hands are are on deck for muscle synthesis and you're lifting weights regularly, you will want to hydrate appropriately. You'll want to eat more healthfully. You won't make such bad food choices. You'll want to go to sleep. That's another huge factor. Disrupted sleep drops you into metabolic dysfunction like that. So all of these things will eventually sort of work themselves out as your instincts start to turn on because we're just fancy mammals with opposable thumbs and we're built upright, but we are just a lever system. And that lever system is designed and our spine is like a hydraulic lift, if you will. And our, we are mechanically built to lift heavy things and put them down. Right. That is what we are designed to do as humans and to ambulate and to swing from things. (laughs) That is how our joints are built. So people want to sit in a chair all day. I mean, what do we do? We like go from our bed to our couch, to our car, to our desk, 
to back to our car, back to our couch, back to our bed. That's America. And that's the pandemic that's really right. caused a lot of issues. So that's kind of the vicious cycle we're in. And I think the solution most quickly is to eat more meat and lift more weights. And you had mentioned um, Mike Mutzel earlier, who I just adore. And I remember him saying a couple of years ago, he was talking about a study where if you, and you just said it too, that if you want to, the fastest way to start reversing this is to, is to work the, the lower half of the body, you know, and, and I commonly see this. And by that, I mean, add weight to it, like, you know, delt the, the glutes, work on the booty, strengthen the booty um, and the thighs as well, because skeletal muscle in that area um, is one of the fastest way to help get you to a metabolically healthy standpoint. And I remember as a kid watching my grandparents as they got older, you know, all of a sudden their little legs shrunk up and their little arms shrunk up and their, their, their booties went away. And now I feel in society, I start to see that. I notice that younger and younger. Um, not to say that you can't have, you know, thighs and a booty, but it's the apple shape. What happens is that the, um, the belly becomes more, more prominent, which, you know, if, especially if it's visceral, that fat that's against the, your organ system, um, it, very concerning just for alcohol. Like I want you to live a long, ha- healthy life. Like, that's my big concern. I mean, you said it in the beginning, I agree. Like, we're not trying to fat shame anyone. We're, I just want you to live a long, healthy life. I don't want you to have high blood pressure and, and, and deal with cholesterol issues and have high risk for, you know, heart disease. Heart disease is the number one killer of humans, period. period. It's right. It's not, <laughs> it's not breast cancer in women. It's, it's not, you know, COVID risk. It's, it's heart disease. And, um, I, I, everyone knows somebody who's on blood pressure pills or on cholesterol pills or has had a stroke or a heart attack or a bypass or, or something, 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 because heart disease is the number one killer of humans. And so when we say these things, this is what we mean because yeah. it's the number one killer. I have never, I was telling my mother-in-law this because I have successfully gotten her blood pressure down to normal and off of all of her medications, except for a low dose of beta blockers. And when I met her, I mean, we're talking stints and or, I mean, the whole thing, it's, yeah. it was a mess. So uh, same with my husband. I mean, it's just a heart attack family for period. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I need everybody alive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to work on this. Right. But you know, they think it's the supplements. Like, well, my husband knows better. She thinks it's the supplements I gave her. And I said, well, those are very helpful. I have never, ever had knock on wood in my 10 years of practice. I never had a patient come in with high blood pressure that I wasn't able to easily reverse Mm -hmm. again quickly. But you know what the number one factor was, was whether they were willing to work on their metabolic health or not. Mm -hmm. As soon as I got them on that tip and they started down that trajectory, even if they kind of screwed around with it a bit and weren't, wasn't real, you know, strict about it, they still had a significant drop in their blood pressure. So that's all this high blood pressure that we see so prevalent. I mean, it's what it's like three times the amount of people, people die of heart disease or cardiovascular disease in this country than do of COVID. And yet no one says anything or nobody wants to address it. And they say, oh, eat plant-based and take your, you know, Lipitor, the number one selling drug in the United States is a statin drug. And it's no surprise, but it's like, or how about you just get your metabolic health in order? And so I told her, I was like, that means all those snacks I see in your kitchen, all that snacky food, we're worried about the waist circumference. That's at the bottom line. We are worried about the waist circumference and we can like split hairs over numbers, but I'll tell you my, I'll tell you my ideal. And then I'll tell you what the data says. It's kind of all over the place. And I know it depends a bit depending on your ethnic background, et cetera. But generally speaking for first off hip to waist ratio, waist circumference alone is actually pretty, a pretty good indicator of your future risk for for metabolic dysfunction or type two diabetes straight up, right? Like we're talking in terms of metabolic dysfunction, what that means is you have di- pre-diabetes or diabetes. That's what that term means. And so I would say 30 inches on a woman at the, be- uh, about two finger breaths above the belly button. That's my ideal clinically, but some of the literature will allow up to 35. But when you get to that 35, that is a red flag alarm going off. Mm-hmm. So It's not like, Hey, that's an okay number to walk around with. That's actually a concerning number. So I would say between 30 and 35 for women, and then it's about 35 to 40 for men. And again, I, you know, my husband walks around, he looks like a tall, thin guy, but he's got a 40 inch waist. (laughs) And I'm Mm -hmm. like, baby, (laughs) come on, let's take that measuring tape out. And he's like, well, my jeans say I'm a 36. And I'm like, ah, nah, nah, (laughs) that is down below the belly. (laughs) right? (laughs) Cause we don't wear our jeans on our belly button. At least we don't anymore. I mean, maybe the young girls do nowadays with the high waist, the high waisted. 
we did in the eighties, but, uh, you know, men think that their waist circumference is really their pant size and it's not, it's right at the belly button. And at 40 inches, my alarms are going off. So Mm -hmm. again, you can look at the data and there's different studies out there saying different things. Those are just my indicators. And then the number two is, so if a patient walks in and they say, Dr. Tina, how do I know if I have metabolic dysfunction? I can test them with lab work, which I think is great, but the international standards are pretty clear. And we've known this since before you and I ever entered into medical school, which is high blood pressure. And that's, that varies, but I would say like 130 over 80, it's probably like we're getting up there. Um, number two is a waist circumference over those inches I just shared. Number three would be if you've got disruption in your lipids. So you're rocking like a high triglyceride or a high LDL. And then um, what are the rest of them? We've got, I'm blanking for a second. We've got- Glucose and insulin. Oh yeah, elevated glucose. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't think they even test insulin for that. So they don't, yeah, that's more functional. Glucose. So that's five because the two lab values. But anyway, if a patient were to come in and they had a thick waist, you could see that visually and they weren't strength training a couple of times a week. And they told me their sleep was disrupted. And I took their blood pressure and it was slightly elevated. I'm like, there's a 99% chance your labs are going to come back with metabolic dysfunction. But who did I just describe? Like everybody in America, most of America (laughs) yeah, or most 40 year old people. Right. So like in my, in our age group, like it's kind of a a hot mess of health when you walk around at our reunion. So, and I say that with love because I don't want anybody to succumb to this because it's been so normalized, like, oh, it's okay. And I get that every body shape is beautiful and you should love yourself at every size, but simply the message I'm sharing is while that may be sustainable while you're young, it really starts to become a massive problem. Always. I've never seen a patient walk into middle age or older without it really starting to take its toll. And when it happens, it happens so fast. Yeah. It's like one day they think they're fine and they're kind of rocking their, you know, a couple beers on the weekend, watching football and a couple of wines on the golf course. And whatever fast food, they eat what the, whatever diet, literally (laughs) like whatever's there (laughs) sandwiches, burritos, you know, whatever. And then boom, high blood pressure, boom, Mm -hmm. but you know, pre-diabetes, diabetes, diabetes, boom that. And then on down the line, the, the issues add up pretty quickly. I, when I was in practice, again, the majority 90 some percent of my clientele were female, of course. And, um, I see to, go off of what you were saying. I see now on social media, um, body love at all ages. And I want to just absolutely reiterate that as we get older and these things can hit hard and fast, these are the women that I would see in my office of all ethnicities. It did not matter. And they were like, um, I am now in my forties or late thirties or, you know, and, uh, everything, like everything hurts. I'm tired all the time. And suddenly it was more symptoms. Whereas youth and age, even if they had uh, more adipose on their, on their system, they were like, I don't care. I feel great. You know, I, I look great. I'm like, great. Okay. Fantastic. But that's not who came into my office. Who came into my office where I don't feel great. My, my joints hurt. My blood pressure is high. Um, I, my, my fat is redistributing. It used to be in my hips and booty. And now I'm getting this belly. I didn't used to have a belly. I used to have like a, a pretty nice small waist. And that's not where I'm at anymore. I'm, I'm out of breath, Carrie. I'm out of breath. I'm, you know, running through the airport prior to, co- you know, this is prior to COVID. I'm running through the airport or my presenters. They're like, I'm, I'm on stage trying to present or in big team meetings trying to present. And I'm sweating and out of breath. And this isn't working for me. I could do it five years ago when I was younger, but now I can't. And and, and just to say, um, we only want you to live longer, <laughs> right? be healthier with, with good quality of with, life, with good quality of life, do your job, be able to raise your kids up, be able to raise your grandkids up. I had a patient who said to me, I just want to be able to lift my carry on above my head and put it in the overhead bin on a plane for the rest of my life. And I was like, I, I will, I'm going to use that quote for as long as I can. Cause that is brilliant. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm going to tell you my response to that because I made a lot of money off of women lifting their overheads into their, <laughs> into the <laughs> airplane <laughs> and stewardesses and stewards yeah. and all of the yeah. flight attendants, I will say, um, because most of them would get to the point where they were, well, this all wreaks havoc on your ligaments and tendons too. Yeah. Yeah. And 
osteoarthritis or any kind of joint pain really at the end of the day, for the most part is metabolic dysfunction of the joint. It's diabetes of the joint. Osteoarthritis is diabetes of the joint. So I tell everybody, check it if you can, because you never know when that day is going to be. Um, and what happens, what happens to all 50, not all, but okay, let's, let me back up. This condition only happens in women, generally speaking, who are peri and postmenopausal and it's frozen shoulder. Yes. And that is oh 100% a metabolic dysfunction disease. They, it gets treated as a biomechanical disease because our shoulder starts to freeze up and it definitely comes from an instigating small trauma, but it's usually small. Like, oh, I was reaching up to the top shelf to grab the laundry basket, or I was reaching up to get my air, my bag out of the airplane, yeah. right? It's something small like that. And they may not even hear a pop. There may not be any mechanical disruption, but the next thing, you know, boom, they're right in. I have seen very thin women with this condition. I, and it's, in my opinion, it is number one, metabolic dysfunction. Number two, I would say, and probably at equally as important as thyroid, yes. but the two of those go hand in hand yep. always. Yep. Right. Yep. Like you, I think people feed their thyroids into submission yeah. by eating all day and eating whatever they eat with the, whatever diet all day. And then number three, all the other hormones that you're such an expert in, but I don't go to those hormones until they've agreed to really dial in their diet and lifestyle. And then we make sure that we're treating the thyroid adequately. And then I start messing with estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and whatever else, usually in a stepwise fashion, because if I throw the hormones at them and they start to feel better, that's awesome. But they'll bonk, you know, like you came on my podcast and we just talked about this. Like if they're not metabolically sound, you, those hormones are awesome for like what, 90 days. And then they hit the wall Yeah, and it all goes to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> yeah. They call you upset. This isn't working. I need more. Yeah. And I'm like, how's that sugar addiction going? Yeah. How's that soda treating you? And it, you know, we can again split hairs about this and that. And people usually want to, especially if they do have some kind of sweet tooth or sugar addiction, which is very prevalent. Uh, people want to, but well, what about this or what about this granola or what about? And I'm like, I don't know, lady, you got to talk to your healthcare practitioner because right. I don't know what your insulin sensitivity is. But right. I will say that at the end of the day, I mean, I joke that I like my butt high and tight, and I like my insulin low and tight. <laughs> <laughs> and in that order. <laughs> And I don't get to have a high and tight booty if my insulin's out of control. <laughs> so then I, I am like, I am one of those apples, like my, I come from a long line of diabetic apples and so, uh, shape people. And they all certainly have all the secondary. That's the thing. I think people don't understand all these conditions we talk about. They are secondary to metabolic dysfunction, in my opinion. And that is the root cause. And that cytokine storm that folks get during COVID when they really start to decompensate and go downhill. And it's that surprising cytokine storm. Once that starts, it's very difficult to put that out. Yeah. And those predominantly are the folks who, I mean, I was getting Intel from all over the world because I was one of the few speaking out against the narrative initially. And so I was getting uh, information from ICU nurses and doctors from all over the world in real time. I think I was getting information that probably very few in the world were getting, and they were all telling me the same thing. Everybody who was getting vented was diabetic and overweight. Mm -hmm. And that's and because and of that eventually cytokine. we heard that eventually the public heard that, but not a lot. It was that but cytokine yeah. storm yeah. you spoke of early yeah. on, yeah. you know, those cytokines, yeah. when they decide to take off and whoo, you know, the fire, it's like, it's very difficult to turn that doctor's hands are tied. There's not much they can do. And so my message always is, and prior to COVID has always been walk in how you walk into anything is how you're going to endure it and how you're going to exit. And so walk in with like a low propensity for cytokine storms. Yeah. Walk in with a low, you know, I, I say your, your slap, put a slab of muscle on your body. Cause that's your best insurance because most of these conditions, including COVID are wasting. Most, all of us got much thinner after COVID, right? Like it was pretty quick. I watched weight fall off me and my husband pretty fast. And even the folks who were highly vaccinated, same thing. It's a wasting condition because of that cytokine storm and age is a wasting condition because of that cytokine storm. And so as we enter menopause, I trained for menopause, literally. That's why I started lifting weights to go back to my story. I was like, I am not entering menopause, a hot mess like my mom. Cause that was a nightmare. My mom walked in with like full blown metabolic syndrome and I decided to train for it and it has been so much nicer. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, and then you get sick, you bounce back, you you endure some kind of chronic stress. You got a little wiggle room. Yeah. You know, yeah. my husband always says, you're so disciplined. You're one of the most, to me, you're one of the most disciplined people I've ever met. How you, how you eat your sleep, your stress management, your, now I'm not perfect. Dark chocolate is my downfall, but, um, my exercise 
He said, why are you, why are you so disciplined in your life? I said, cause my family lives a very long time. My grandparent, I, I was, let's see here. I was 40 when I lost my last, last grandparent. I mean, I knew my grandparents, they wow. were into their late eighties, early nineties when I knew all my grandparents. And so uh, I knew my, as a little kid, I knew my great grandparents, like my family lives a long time and I would prefer to live my life knowing I want to be mobile and traveling and having a hell of a good time. I do not want to be, um, in a wheelchair. I, you know, I don't want to be in a care home where I am not able to take care of myself. I am wasted away. I am not mobile. I am, um, my brain health is not good, et cetera, et cetera. I look at my family tree and go, okay, longevity is on my side. Let's work on health span, right? I have the lifespan, God forbid, unless I get hit by a bus or something, um, but health span. And so that's why I, I am so disciplined. And a lot of things are going to pop up in between there, pandemics and viruses, and stressful situations and other diseases, you know, and I want to be able to survive and thrive because I can see it in my genetics. And, you know, I want that for just like you, right? We want that for everyone. Let's yeah. work on that, on that health span. So you can get that wiggle room. You got to be in good fighting shape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, I just ornery. Yeah. I got to, <laughs> I get more yes. ornery the older I get. You just, I was just thinking when you said you live, you're going to live a long time. I'm like, she's just going to stay beautiful forever. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's the okay. goal. <laughs> vanity, you know, pain and vanity. Yeah. I found pain and vanity to be two huge motivators in my practice for people. Pain and vanity will and definitely- it, yep. So let's just go down the line though, really quick. As you were talking, I was thinking of so many things, like let's talk about the issues that people do deal with when they get older, yeah. right? And as we age, let's talk about brain dysfunction, dementia and Alzheimer's metabolic dysfunction, yeah. thyroid issues, metabolic dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, metabolic dysfunction, breast cancer. You know, you were talking about these women walking into your practice and like, boom, one day everything was not okay. A lot of those women, unfortunately are walking in saying, boom, I got breast cancer. How did I get this? Yeah. And then I see them doing the, the, breast cancer awareness walk in downtown Portland, carrying their voodoo donut boxes. And I'm like, that is yeah. an oxymoron. Delta, Delta <laughs> airlines, because the month of October paint some of their, their planes pink and they sell alcoholic beverages that are pink and they have pink snacks and they oh. have pink soda. Um, and it's, everything's pink and all the proceeds to the alcohol, the snacks and the soda go to it, it you know, whatever breast cancer awareness group that they're, they're focusing on. And every time and their napkin, and I'm like, Delta, are you serious right now? You're pumping these women full of sugar and alcohol in the name of preventing breast cancer. Oh. I don't think you've got this right. And I am a diehard Delta fan, but woo, missing the boat, missing the boat, missing yeah. the plane. <laughs> yeah. And then move on down. Uh, I mean, we go into the gut system and that so much of that is contingent on, and, and your microbiome is yeah. contingent on the amount of refined carbohydrates and alcohol we consume or lack. I mean, I always say America's just basically malnourished and overfed yeah. to a large degree, and then moved on into the ovaries and into the musculoskeletal system and into the, especially into the hips. Mm -hmm. Most people don't realize when women's hips start to melt again, what age are they usually pre or post-menopausal their hips just melt. I've seen it so many times in clinical practice. One day they're fine. It happened to me. It happened to me in my forties and I was quite lean. Um, that's generally a hormone slash metabolic issue. And I'm going to throw the hat out here and take responsibility. I think it was because I was drinking too much Yeah, alcohol. I yeah. think that's what really started that ball. And, and I have to give you props. And I know I've said this before, but I want to say it for your audience. We are like texting buddies. And I would always text you the past few years and be like, I don't know what every fourth or fifth cycle, I'd be like, why do my boobs hurt so bad? <laughs> What's going on with my breasts? They're, it's so terribly painful. Why am I having PMS? I normally don't have, well, like if I eat well and I take care of myself, I don't normally have much PMS and you'd always text back. It's the wine, Tina. Or you text me a little wine emoji. <laughs> it's the wine. <laughs> and I didn't drink a lot. And I've talked about this before on my own podcast, but I just drank consistently. And probably at times of high stress, I probably did drink too much for somebody my size. And so anyway, I, I think any amount at this point is can't is pretty cancer causing. I think the data's out, but, and I'm not shaming anyone to each his own. It's just why I quit, but I think I did instigate it. And I think that was messing with my metabolism and my hormones yeah. ultimately. So yeah. yeah, all the way down to plantar fasciitis, chronic plantar fasciitis, chronic uh, toe infections, like ingrown toenails, all of the stuff can literally be tied back to metabolic health. Yeah. So. I 
a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I know we could keep talking forever and ever and ever. The last thing though, I want to wrap up on is sleep. Cause we touched on sleep, but we haven't gotten into sleep. Can you explain to people? And I know everyone can relate to this. I was, I had, I go, I traveled to a lot of conferences and one of the people I was at a conference with, it was his first conference ever. And we had to get up super early and catch the flight and, you know, get to the, from the West coast to the East coast. And he's like, I'm starving. I'm so hungry. And I don't normally eat this early in the morning. And I said, because we got no sleep, we got no sleep. We had a lot of stress, you know, we got to the hotel late and then we had to get up to be ready for the conference at six 30 in the ungodly morning. That's what time the conference started. And when you were normally in my normal routine, that's I six 30 is not when I I'll be honest, it's not when I get up in the morning. And so, <laughs> but I had to be, I was already up, showered, journaled, ready to go. And so my whole sleep, when your sleep is disrupted, it completely throws off your hunger signals in your blood sugar. So in this instance, he's like, why am I starving at 6 30 in the morning? And I was like, oh, because sleep plays a big role in this. And we didn't get any. Yeah. And how your metabolic health is going into that. Yeah. How good are you at handling that? You know, those blood sugar just, uh, curves. I think the easiest way that I describe it to folks is just very simply that we have the data to show this. If you slap on a continuous glucose monitor, you too will see it. If you skimp on your sleep or you don't hit the necessary amount of hours, or maybe your deep sleep's thrown off because of alcohol or stress or what have you, your blood sugar handling the next day will be a train wreck. And if you do it for enough nights in a row, you're really literally like you are for a time span considered, I mean, you have metabolic dysfunction. It's induced by your aberrant sleep. Yeah. And so we can throw that in the bag of, we just described the average American. And I, again, that uh, that's no fault of anyone's at this point, I think, but the food industry and the powers that be for not educating people properly, but throw in all that sleep dysregulation and like, I don't even want to know what their continuous glucose monitors look like. Yeah. They're eating all day and they're sleep deprived and they're not eating a lot. You know, it's not a lot of nutritious. I mean, you, you know, you drive from here to Seattle, like there's literally nowhere to eat anything healthful for the yeah. most part. Yeah. It's just, I get it. Like people don't have a lot of choices and I live in a food desert. I get it. So it's, it's just kind of a sign of the times. And so we really have to make these concerted efforts. I think, you know, as GI Joe says, knowing is half the battle. So <laughs> we got to know. So now we know, and you know, I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of assets to dig into for folks if they're interested. I know that you do a lot of good work around the subject. I know that there's a lot of people out there. So yeah. really it's just further educating oneself and understanding yeah. how they can live a more metabolically healthy lifestyle. But I think numero uno, get your sleep. Don't skimp on that. Don't mess with that. That is like sacred. I have broken yeah. up with men before for not being good sleepers. I'm like, you're out, dude. <laughs> You're messing with my sleep. <laughs> I know we've been dating a few months, but this, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah. You got to go. And number two, make strength training a priority if you haven't before. And if you do now, you know why it's so important to continue with it. So those are my two big take-homes. And I would say, you know, thirdly, trying to mitigate stress as best you can in this weird world we live in now and trying to, you know, pick our battles when we can. And I'm constantly talking. I mean, you know me, I, I'm always joking about the dark side of things, but I'm usually the one telling my friends like, hey, pick your battles on this one. Just stay the course, yep. <laughs> stay healthy. Yeah. Yep. Well, let's walk into winter season as, as sharp as we can. And the great thing is, and a lot of the things that you're recommending, you know, I fully recognize that everybody's in a different season and has a different kind of budget, but like sleep, you know, like sleep is free going to bed on time, stopping scrolling, stop turning the TV off at a decent hour. That is free. You can get good sleep and not have to spend any money on it. Even exercise body weight exercises. If you, if you're zero, if your couch to one, you know, even just starting body weight exercises, go for a walk, like just start the movement somewhere that you don't have to join a gym. You don't have to pay expensive things. There are a lot of free things on social media, on YouTube. I don't belong to a gym. I'll be honest. I have slowly accumulated some workout equipment over time. I follow people for free on YouTube and, you know, do their weight exercise uh, programs when uh, I'm in the season of it. And it, you can, you can join a gym and hire a trainer and do all the things, which, you know, ultimately is great. If you're brand new to it, we recommend it, but if it's not your budget, you can start 
low budge. You can start for oh, free. Yeah. <laughs> and can... walk, just walk after just meals. Walk. I mean, that's yeah. like naturopathic 101. It's so yeah. fun to watch studies catch up with what we've known for decades, yeah. but you know, we have data on it now. If that makes people feel better, walk yeah. after meals, just walk after meals, commit yeah. to that. That's huge. Eat ten, five, 10 minutes. It's not like going at, for an hour, a little 10 minute walk around. Do you have your lunch break? Save the last 10 minutes to do a quick little walk and uh, that'll help your blood sugar exponentially. Yep. My God, Tina, this is amazing. Tell everyone where they can find you. Yes. Uh, thank you. That was, it's always so fun to talk to you. We need our <laughs> own show. I'm telling you. <laughs> we can just go so, back and forth. I know. <laughs> someday. <laughs> it was ping pong. Exactly. Uh, you guys can find me on Instagram. I'd love if you'd follow me there. It's it's at Dr. Tina, D-R-T-Y-N-A. And then my website has all my goodies. It's D-R-T-Y-N-A.com. And I've got a podcast called The Dr. Tina Show. And your episode is coming out this week. So Ooh. everybody come over there to listen to Dr. Carrie Jones on The Dr. Tina Show. And those are probably the best places to start. I love it. And your book, you have a book. Oh yeah, I have a book. It's on my website. All the goodies are on the website. Everything I tie back, I tie everything back to metabolic health if I can. So that's always my goal is to put the pieces together. So people understand the importance of what it is that I'm trying to say. It's not just about, um, cause I think I'm holier than thou. This is about resilience and trying to get through the zombie apocalypse. So I love it. Well, once again, everyone go follow her, go check her out. Dr. Tina, it's Tina with a Y. Every time I have my, uh, uh, headphones in and it reads me text messages. It says from Tina. <laughs> <laughs> Tina Moore. <laughs> Tina Moore. It says from, from Tina. <laughs> I love so it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being on. You are just a wealth of information. And I know, I know this has been eye opening for a lot of people, or it's at least been confirmatory for a lot of people who have long suspected this. And now they, now they know what to do, or it just solidifies what they've already been doing. So thank you. Yes. Thanks for having me. I love you. I love the work you do. Keep it up. And thank you for being my friend. Well, it is mutual. <laughs>